Welcome back to the Vermont House of uh, Tra House Transportation Committee. It is just uh, after afternoon of uh, Thursday, uh, February 18th, just a little bit after floor, but almost a quarter of two. We're about to start to hear uh, some afternoon testimony on, um, on the pilot that was put into place uh, a bit ago, the micro transit. And then at three o'clock, we're gonna hear from the Agency of Digital Services around the um, expected DMV uh, investment in their um, IT. But before we start, if we could just take a couple minutes to look at your letter, because we're gonna, our letter to House Appropriations, do people need a moment to find it or, but, Anthea sent it out again with with the revisions kept kept in the yellows where she made the made the changes. So basic, you know, it says the general in general the House Committee on Transportation supports the governor's recommend for the FY22 big bill proposal language as it's related to transportation. However, the House Committee on Transportation may have additional recommendations on the money monetary values included in the governor's recommend language yeah. once we finish our work on the transportation bill. Somebody just come in. I see Representative Shaw. Yes, sir. You're muted though. I apologize for being late. It's all right. We were just we were just taking up the letter to take a quick look at the, the letter to approps. We're not gonna That's we're not right. gonna make a yeah, the finish on it until after ADS, but if we got a second here before we start with micro transit. Thank you. We could we could be that much farther ahead of the game. So I was just reading the um, first paragraph that pretty much sums up our our position. People are coming in. I'll start. The we're just going over the letter. We're not voting on it. We're just kind of preparing a little bit more. I see Gabrielle came in. In general, the House Committee on Transportation supports the governor's recommended FY22 big bill proposed language as it's related to the as as it relates to transportation. However, the House Committee on Transportation may have additional recommendations on the monetary values included in the governor's recommend language once we finish our work on the transportation bill and I will update you accordingly. The committee's response on each section identified for comment by the House Committee on Appropriations is listed below. And then it goes into where we support the Downtown Transportation and Capital Improvement Fund and, and that we support it. And then there's highlighted language that says, in addition, the committee is working with the administration, the Vermont League of Cities and Towns, the interested municipalities to determine if existing grant parameters should be modified, possibly with a higher grant amount or a lower municipal match requirement or both. And we may make a suggestion on any additional, any, on, on an additional notwithstanding clause for inclusion in the big bill. So that says, you know, we love the program. We still might make changes to it. And then the next section on the electric vehicle incentives is the same thing. The committee supports this recommendation, but which may include additional funding. It says may, we don't know. We're, we're, holding, we're holding our cards on that. And then we added a little bit of a, um, where the T-bill had included the, the PEV incentives, grants for charging infrastructure and a new program to encourage Vermonters to replace their ride in favor of mode of transportation that uh, produces fewer greenhouse gas emissions. Okay, I think we've seen all of that. That is enough of like, yep, we like it, but we just don't know how much money we wanna put into it yet, we'll let you know. The next section, which is around the TIB bond service fund, I don't think we had any issues with around that at all. We are fine with that as it was. And then the IT was the committee supports this recommendation. And then it goes on to say, and the highlighted, not only does the committee support this appropriation for the first phase, but needs to stress the importance of funding this replacement fully, which is expected to require an additional two phases 
of approximately the same ap appropriation amount. It is imperative that this replacement be completed as soon as practicably, given how outdated this system is and the need to upgrade to a new system that can keep pace with the increased needs of the Department of Motor Vehicles in Vermonters. And then the final is we're gonna leave in the language of the um, town highway aid notwithstanding until we make a decision about that as well. Um, anybody have, wanna digest that a little bit? And then, so I'd be looking for after ADS's testimony today, if we can, if people are comfortable, but only if you're comfortable, we'll just send this over like representative Corcoran says, we will hit send. So the only thing we'll do is take a quick roll call with our clerk after ADS, unless anybody would like to wait until tomorrow morning. I wanna make sure you're, you're fine. I don't think there's anything complicated. And then if we get it tonight, then we'll have Anthea send it over tomorrow. Sounds like a plan. Not seeing any hands, good. Thank you for your cooperation. So, we have coming up, we're gonna hear now micro, the micro transit for us that are just new to the committee, we weren't here when, when you guys invented this <laughs> or funded it. <laughs> so we're gonna hear a little bit about what it is because we're, we're, we're hearing from people that they wanna support it more. They wanna see it expand it. We're gonna hear from the people who are on the ground actually doing it and what's going on and we'll get a better idea of that direction. Can, so this, I, can I put yeah. inventor on my resume? Inventor, yes. Can I put oh. inventor on my resume then? I think you could put inventor of the internet. Didn't you, I, I'm pretty sure representative, didn't you? Representative, representative, representative. Didn't you? Micro transit, yeah. A micro transit. Micro transit. Right. You guys, um, I put you it, guys, um, I put it. You put it into existence. So we're gonna, we'll, you'll have to bear with us new people that haven't, haven't quite learned all of what that was about and that there's a lot of call for how exciting it is, including myself that thought it was pretty cool. All right, with, if we're a go, we're live. Lori, does our guest have the ability to um, run the co-host so that if they have something to put up on the screen? Which one of you would um, like that ability? Um, I'll need the ability to share my screen. Thank you, Lori. Yep. Just a sec. So we have with us, right, Ross McDonald, Dan Courier, Jamie, Jamie Smith, and John Moore, right? Great. Yes, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for having us. You're um, welcome. I don't see Ross and Dan, but uh, we're happy to get going. Um, I know okay. your time is, is valuable. Um, so yes, I'm John Moore. I'm the general manager at Green Mountain Transit. Uh, Jamie Smith is our director of uh, marketing and planning uh, and has acted as the project manager for the uh, exciting launch of this new service. So uh, our hopes today is uh, just to give a quick introduction uh, to the microtransit uh, philosophy, uh, share some of the uh, excitement that we have in the potential of the uh, service model and then uh, Jamie will get into a uh, brief PowerPoint with some of the specifics of uh, actual operating details uh, that we've seen in the first six weeks of service. Um, we started this service back uh, on January 4th um, and uh, we'll, we'll provide some of the uh, actual details that uh, we've witnessed. Uh, first off, I wanna thank um, VTrans, I, I see Dan joining now. Um, and the Sustainable Montpelier Coalition. Uh, they've been great partners to GMP <laughs> as we've uh, moved forward uh, with the launch of this service. Um, also wanna thank the city of Montpelier. Uh, they've provided the local match uh, for the service. Um, and while the service started uh, you know, in early January, it was really a multi-year process um, to get this, the service uh, on the road. Um, so in addition to VTrans and Sustainable Montpelier, uh, there's a large and diverse uh, local stakeholder group uh, that really uh, led uh, the project development um, leading up to the launch of the service. So, um, you know, one key takeaway that we've learned is that having that initial stakeholder buy-in uh, was critical, um, and we'll continue working with that group as we, um, you know, move forward with the service and look at any needed adjustments 
Um, so we're maximizing the, uh, the efficiency of the service. Um, so really a quick background, um, prior to January 4th, uh, GMT operated three routes uh, wholly within the city of Montpelier, uh, the Montpelier Hospital Hill route, the Montpelier Circulator, uh, and usually uh, uh, pre-pandemic days, the Capital Shuttle, which uh, you all may be familiar with. Uh, so the, the premise of the Microtransit MyRide pilot project was to take the resources from those three routes and repurpose them into this microtransit uh, project, uh, in addition uh, to some uh, VTrans uh, funds, additional funds to help kind of fill the gaps of some technology investments and potentially, uh, if this is successful, uh, the hope is that we'll need to provide more service to, to, meet, uh, to meet the demand. Um, so one thing I will say is, you know, the first goal that we had coming into this uh, was to make sure that existing passengers, you know, maintained access to our, our service. Um, and just for some background, any service change that we implement, even relatively minor schedule or routing changes, um, you know, provide challenges uh, to some of our passengers. Change is difficult. Um, you know, when you're talking about making change in terms of uh, schedule times or routing, there may be a longer walking distance. Um, so that, that was to be expected. Um, you know, this service, was certainly um, uh, a much more uh, in-depth kind of uh, fundamental change to how we provide service in Montpelier. And while we're uh, very excited about the potential uh, for the service, you know, we do understand that it does uh, create challenges uh, for some individuals. Um, so while we do offer a, a call center with a phone-in uh, trip scheduling option for passengers, the system is really optimized by the use of uh, smartphone technology. And we certainly recognize and understand that not everybody has access um, to a smartphone. So in addition to the, uh, the call-in um, piece that you know, over 50% of our passengers are actually calling into our call center to book their trips, um, we'll continue to work with our stakeholders and the public uh, to make sure that we have uh, as much access to the system as, as possible. Um, for example, um, uh, VSIL is working on a project to provide um, cell phones uh, to folks. So uh, there's a lot of options out there. Um, you know, one th other thing we're looking at is providing some, um, I guess we'll call them a pay phone for a lack of a better term, but an outdoor phone that's free um, that would call directly to our call center. So um, we want to demo that, you know, at the Montpelier Transit Center to start. Um, but these are on the market for three or four hundred dollars. They're not super expensive, and if we can locate these um, at high ridership stop, high ridership stops, it gives people the availability to have a you know a low tech option to you know book the trips that, that they need to. Um, so we're uh, committed to continue working uh, with our uh, our passengers and, and uh, stakeholders um, so that everyone can access uh, this this new service. Um, the second goal that we have uh, with the project is really uh, an attempt to maximize our operating efficiency uh, and at the end of the day to increase ridership, to increase our mode share and to get as many people uh, on the bus as possible um, and all the benefits that, that that can create from economic development to uh, environmental benefits, land use, planning benefits, uh, reduced congestion. Uh, one of the prime or initial goals for the Sustainable Montpelier Coalition uh, was try to uh, minimize the amount of parking needed in Montpelier uh, so that land could be repurposed for more community uh, benefit. Um, increasing transit ridership can achieve uh, all of those things. Um, in terms of our hopes in, in uh, uh, ways that we see uh, microtransit accomplishing those goals, um, number one, you know, it's designed to increase uh, passenger convenience and the passenger experience uh, and will really allow passengers to take transit on their schedules and not on our schedule. And what I mean by that, um, previously, um, you know, when we operated uh, the Montpelier Hospital Hill route, for example, that only operated once an hour. Um, so if you had a, a doctor's appointment at, you know, 1 p.m., but the bus dropped you off at 110, that really meant you had to get there at 1210. So you're waiting almost an hour for your appointment. You may have the same wait after the appointment. So, you know, a, a 10 minute trip just turned into a two hour trip. Microtransit, you know, gives the user the ability uh, for real time scheduling. Um, if you need a schedule and arrival at uh, one o'clock, 
we'll schedule that pickup to get you there at that time. You can also do it um, on that same day. If you know, you're at the office and you want to go grab lunch, you can do that. So the flexibility that it provides, um, I think will be a game changer in terms of uh, drawing new people to the service while maintaining that access that we uh, know is critical to our existing passengers. Um, number two, um, we really feel uh, it can allow us to expand our service areas. Um, and that, that's really twofold. Number one, it's the physical access that we just don't have available when you're driving a 40 foot bus uh, into residential neighborhoods. Uh, but number two, it can expand um, you know, how we can operate service in a more efficient way. Um, and that definitely applies to some rural areas, which uh, you know, Vermont is largely rural, but can also apply uh, in our Chittenden and County service areas. Um, and one quick case study I just thought of uh, this morning I wanna share. Uh, is in Williston Village. Um, so we operate high frequency service uh, to tap the Taft Corners area, if you're familiar with that. But, you know, two miles to the east is kind of Williston Village, um, kind of a historic village area, um, a lot of new residential development. So there is some density out there. Uh, and we did start operating service um, that we had to eliminate a few years ago due to lack of uh, ridership. But from our perspective, lack of ridership is not the same as lack of demand or need. Um, we really think that we were operating that service in incorrectly based on the um, kind of on the ground realities. So we operated that service with a 40 foot bus because that's all we have in our fleet in Burlington. We operated two trips in the morning and two trips in the afternoon. So if uh, people's schedules didn't work around those times, there was no flexibility. And because of the size of the bus, we couldn't access um, you know, these new residential developments, you know, off the main corridor. And there's fairly limited pedestrian amenities. So uh, really what it meant was we couldn't get to the passengers and the passengers couldn't get to us safely. So while the ridership never materialized, you know, we think there's at least a potential. It wasn't because of a lack of demand. It was uh, a bad fit in service design. And that's really where microtransit can, can step in and uh, fill that void. Um, in a place like Williston Village, but in countless communities, you know, through Vermont, um, where, you know, operating a 40 foot bus will never make sense, but there is critical need that we need to meet somehow. Um, so we really think that's, you know, the, the ultimate um, potential of microtransit, and uh, we're excited to explore that further. Um, in terms of cost efficiency, you know, we have some high hopes that we can realize some economies of scale. Uh, through microtransit um, uh, applications. In terms of trying to uh, combine different passenger programs with one vehicle. Uh, so like all of the transit properties in Vermont, uh, GMT provides uh, in our rural areas, uh, Medicaid transportation, elders and disabled transportation, general public transportation and ADA transportation. Historically, those have been done kind of in silos. So we may have four passengers with four different vehicles on the road. With microtransit, you know, we have the ability to start combining trips onto one vehicle, uh, realize some cost savings, and then recycle those cost savings into more service, which in turn makes our service uh, more attractive and increases ridership. So, um, you know, we're, we're very excited about that. Uh, the first mile, last mile connection um, has always been a challenge with transit, you know, even in Chittenden County where we operate, you know, high frequency service. We really try to concentrate um, to the main corridors. So there's uh, a lot of areas where we can get you a mile or two from your end destination, but uh, you're on your own from there. Um, you know, we work with bike share and, and you know, regional planning commissions to, to, to um, you know, complete those connections. But in the middle of the winter, you know, not everyone wants to ride a bike and that's where micro transit can come in, where the trunk line will get you, you know, 90% of the way there, you hop off, you hop on a waiting vehicle and that will get you to your end destination. So another, um, you know, potential benefit that we really see with micro transit. Uh, in terms of other efficiencies, you know, it does allow uh, transit properties to uh, implement some dynamic scheduling. Uh, so really what that means is we can, you know, have more buses on the road when passenger demand is high and fewer buses on the road when passenger demand is, is low. So it's really allows us to match supply and demand. Uh, and that's just not possible when you have a printed schedule that you're bound to, you know, you have to operate the service that you have published to the uh, public. Um, lastly, um, another operating uh, cost savings that we uh, see a lot of potential is uh, in right sizing our vehicle fleet. 
Um, so right now, uh, generally speaking, we have you know one size vehicle in Burlington and one size vehicle in our St. Albans and our uh, uh, Montpelier operations. Uh, Micro transit, you know, with that flexibility comes uh, different fleet makeup. You know, smaller vehicles, lower operating costs, uh, potentially lower labor costs and maintenance costs. Um, so again, another cost containment strategy where we can reduce our operating costs to provide more service to the public, which at the end of the day will meet that ultimate goal of uh, increasing ridership. So overall, um, you know, we're extremely excited about the potential uh, of this. Again, uh, it's only been about six weeks um, and we have actually seen um, a slight decrease in our productivity um, from before uh, uh, we started this service in terms of ridership. Um, but again, understanding that change is always hard. You know, that's, that's pretty typical where you see a slight uh, temporary ridership reduction with a service change. Uh, when this started early January, there was certainly a spike in COVID cases, and uh, we're still asking the public to prioritize essential travel, and we have occupancy limits on our buses for social distancing. Um, so that certainly plays into it. So there's still, you know, some uncertainties exactly how this will play out, but um, based on the potential of the service, uh, we're excited to operate the pilot project and, and see uh, if it makes sense to expand in other GMT service areas. Um, so that's a quick introduction. With that, I'll turn it over to Jamie and she can provide uh, some details of what we've seen. Uh, and afterwards, we're happy to answer any questions uh, you folks may have. Thank you, John. I actually like I'm inkly following you and made about two pages worth of notes off, over, off of what you said. You are one of the pilots. Just I, I apologize for my ignorance on the, on the bigger package. I wasn't here last year. You are one of the pilots or the or is it all within your, with Green Mountain Transit? So I'll let Ross and Dan uh, from VTrans okay. confirm this, but to my understanding, we're the first and only pilot project to date. Hopefully that changes and we can expand the, the pilot okay. area. Okay, and you've, and you've only been there for six weeks so far. Correct, the service has been operating for about six weeks. Okay. Okay, I'll let the others, I'll let the others come in and, and I just want to remember sure. that. Like, what did we put in? Ross we might know this, but what did we put in for dollars for that last, for this pilot? Madam Chair, uh, Ross McDonald's uh, public transit program manager. And uh, yes, uh, if you recall a few weeks ago, I, I provided in the overview that we had a working group that uh, looked at microtransit writ large um, with uh, costs and opportunity and feasibility studies and white papers. Then we turned to our providers and asked if anybody was interested in piloting. And with Sustainable Montpelier Coalition and GMT being part of that working group, uh, they uh, uh, volunteered and uh, it's costing us about an extra $200,000 for us to transition these two routes and that legislative shuttle, uh, the capital shuttle, if you remember, uh, uh, to uh, the microtransit service, and uh, we'll continue to gauge those costs. What I've done is we, what we've been waiting for is initial early results and feedback, of which, as you see uh, uh, from John's comments, uh, there's really not too much uh, uh, that uh, we don't want to, uh, to, to replicate around the, the state. Uh, that I've asked our providers this morning during their Vermont Public Transit Association annual meeting to please consider their own regions, their own routes, and to come to us with any ideas uh, where we could transition additional circulator in-town type routes to a microtransit regional service. Uh, so we'll wait for the applications for FY22, see who would like to, those come in around April, We'll see who would like to transition to microtransit and fund a feasibility study first. And then if that feasibility comes in uh, uh, in a positive way, then we would uh, work to transition uh, that region from routes to regional service. Great, thank you. I am trying desperately to get all of that <laughs> down because it is wow. absolutely golden. Representative McCoy, please. Thank you. I don't know if this uh, question is for Ross or John. Did uh, GMT have to purchase a micro bus, a smaller bus, in order to provide these services through um, Montpelier, the Montpelier area, or did you have buses already available? 
So we had buses already available. Um, a few years ago, we did start to diversify our fleet and move to some smaller vehicles uh, to kind of meet some, um, you know, trips that don't need a, a, a 18 passenger van. Uh, through working with VTrans, uh, we do have a couple um, procurements uh, that we're uh, preparing. Uh, one is for some smaller sprinter type vehicles, which we think will provide um, you know, lower operating costs, uh, still provide the capacity we need for micro transit. And then also um, looking at procuring some small electric uh, vehicle cutaways that would be designated for the micro transit uh, service when those are available on the market. Okay, so that is the 200,000 transition because you're running more buses because you're, you have the schedule with the larger buses and now you're using the smaller buses. Well, some of it's the technology piece. So um, there's a direct consumer to bus um, type communication, which required tablets on board and um, a backend software system and, and also some unknown. So, um, you know, I think the worst case scenario uh, would have been that demand outpaced our ability to provide the service. So we wanted some backup funds in place. Um, so as demand grows, we can grow our, our service operation. So we haven't spent down that 200,000 to date, but it's, it's there uh, as needed, um, working with Ross and VTrans to, to use that as efficiently as possible. And There's sure the marketing component too. Like the marketing and advertising plays a piece of that as well. Yes, thank you. Uh, if I so may, I just- On that point, uh, is the marketing and transportation done by V, by VTrans or by GMT? I mean, who provides that service? GMT uh, and uh, SMC, they're uh, working with uh, the advisory group. So we had a, a, a microtransit working group that transitioned and grew to a microtransit advisory group. And that has cohorts from senior living to uh, independent living uh, to Sustainable Montpelier Coalition, they are all working through their uh, channels of communication and their clients serve to talk about this service. And so there's been earned media. Uh, it's been a pretty concerted effort. Um, and I can let certainly Jamie, uh, who's been managing all of this, uh, speak further to that. On uh, backing up, uh, if we have three vehicles on three routes during peak times, Capital Shuttle, uh, Hospital Hill, Circulator, Right now, we're operate, they, GMT is operating about three vehicles uh, at one time. So operationally, uh, we're not seeing a huge uh, increase in vehicle needs. We'll see when we get back to uh, post-COVID, pre-COVID uh, type of uh, effects. But uh, when you add in the demand response services to those three routes, we then could see maybe a fourth or fifth vehicle in that same region doing Medicaid, ADA, or um, uh, E&D type services in addition to those three vehicles. So overall, as John had mentioned, this could be an operational pickup uh, using fewer vehicles for more trips. Yeah, and additionally, it's, it, you're six weeks in, that's, that's pretty young for a, a pilot to even have any you know, numbers to let us know, so thank you. Thank you, Representative McCoy. Representative White. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just had a quick question because I think I'm I'm running into a bit of confusion on my end with the um, MTI grants that were awarded and trying to understand just, I, I was under the impression just looking at the list of grantors to the MTI that this was a part of that. But if I'm understanding what you said, Ross, this is separate from that grant program? Well, um, kind of. Uh, that uh, We do have one of the MTI projects, and, and I'm happy to say that Dan Courier is here with us today as, and uh, as the Govermont program manager, my old job, he's managing the MTI projects. And we'll introduce you to Dan. He's also been taking the microtransit pro, uh, service. But um, one of those projects is uh, additional funds for Sustainable Montpelier Coalition to do the uh, robust outreach and um, uh, survey work that's associated with this pilot. So we were able to use some of those funds, uh, separate funds. Uh, we're using general operations for the service, if that's good. That is, thank you. I was like, wait a minute, where am I? 
because the 200,000 number wasn't jiving with, I think, if I look correctly, like the $45,000 number. Yep. So I really appreciate you clarifying that. And I put a link in the chat with the link um, to that we have on the state website to all the different um, 2021 awardees. So thank you for okay. that. Because I think that's where I was too, because I was looking for, I was give, I was thinking that the MTI was the same as microtransit. Oh, no. See, this no. is... M Transportation demand management, uh, MTI, that could be supporting bike, uh, uh, multimodal effects, operations, outreach, awareness, technologies, all of that stuff. And um, again, uh, Dan, uh, is, uh, we, we've offered Dan up to present the panoply of, uh, uh, of projects that uh, MTI has allowed us to proceed uh, with. Okay, so and, and that we're gonna get to today, right? This is uh, well, we, we were talking about uh, microtransit. Uh, I'm sure Dan can uh, talk a little bit about where we started and uh, where we are today. We just haven't done a lot of uh, activity since we've awarded in, in December with the holidays and uh, with the grant uh, agreements getting up and running. Everybody's got a notice to proceed. But anyway, uh, Dan, uh, where are we right now? With, well, well, let's we, we won't go there. You're just helping to clarify some of us that are getting, you know, that we that we had those two as the same, and they're they're two different. So we've got the 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 micro micro transit at Green Mountain Transit in Montpelier is three routes, not three places. Three routes are being uh, reconfigured with this new model of uh, direct access, and they've been doing it for six weeks. And we'll hear about that. And then, then, we're, then I'd love it if we've got time, we have until three to get an update on, on the other, the MTI grant process. But I think, Jamie, you're Green Mountain Transit. Correct. And, and I have some information, yeah. just some early metrics to share. Okay. So I'm gonna share so why don't you share that and then we'll shift from Green Mountain Transit micro micro to then to the other. All right. right. All right. Thanks. <laughs> Takes me a minute sometimes, but I get there. <laughs> Is everybody able to see my screen? Yes. Great. So um, I think John gave a pretty good introduction to the service. So um, we're referring to it as a flexible route, flexible schedule service. Um, and as mentioned, it's a technology enabled service that uh, we have tablets on our vehicle that basically feed information live to our drivers about where passengers are, where they'd like to be picked up and where they need to go. The hours of operation are very similar to the fixed route service we had on the road. Um, and as a reminder, the service began January 4th. So I'm just gonna. Well, I'm gonna say that you have already because people have gotten to my ears going, oh, please, that, that make sure that that stays in there. They're, they're loving, I'm getting feedback right. from, yeah, that people it, are liking it. I think a lot of people are liking it so far. Um, you know, there are some folks that are having a bit of a challenge as John mentioned, but we are working um, with those folks individually, as well as um, the folks at Sustainable Montpelier Coalition. There's a lot of sort of um, not handholding, but really individual um, outreach happening to folks who are having challenges with that service. So this is the MyRide service area map. Um, if we had an under layer here, you would see that this is quite a bit of an expansion over where we were operating with the fixed route service. And as John mentioned, that uh, first mile, last mile piece, uh, the folks on the perimeter of this service map didn't have great access to the fixed route service. Um, they often had to travel into that service area. So in the first month, we saw about 1,436 rides, which um, as John mentioned, is slightly below November and December. I think that was expected. Uh, we have to date, uh, 210 active riders. So um, that's, we have a lot more accounts created, as you can see, 513 people have created their accounts and 210 of them are actually using the service pretty regularly. Um, 324 people have made at least one trip. So that's really great numbers. Um, I don't think that we had that many people riding our fixed route service. Um, individual people. We had folks that were riding the service frequently, but I think we've attracted some new riders here, which is a good thing. And you can see 41% of those riders are taking a, have taken more than uh, two and about five trips. So 
we have folks who are riding every day. Um, we have folks that are riding, you know, if they have regular appointments, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, um, we have a lot of folks using recurring trips. So the average trip time right now is about 8.8 .8 minutes. So what that means, um, and this is a really interesting metric to go back to what John was saying about hourly service. If somebody requests a ride, say at noon, the ride, uh, the trip time that they're getting is within 8.8 .8 minutes of that requested time. So for a convenience factor, that's a really great um, option for folks. You know, it's, it's a lot more convenient than waiting an hour if they've just missed the Montpelier Hospital Hill, for example, and having to wait for the next ride. Uh, the average ride distance currently is 3.3 miles. So there's a lot of folks um, using this service in downtown Montpelier and staying sort of within downtown, which is really interesting to see. Um, the average walking distance right now is 20.1 feet. So uh, Dan Courier, on, who's on this call, <laughs> has sent me a picture of the bus right in his driveway. So for a lot of people, this is, you know, really convenient for them and uh, the access is, is a lot easier. Um, so keeping in mind that this service was sort of originally set to Medicaid rules, when somebody books a trip, they're given a pickup window with of 15 to 30 minutes. So the bus could arrive from noon to 1230. Um, as, we, as you get closer to that trip time, about an hour before it locks into place and folks are getting a robocall that says, your bus will be there at 12.15. So it's giving them a, a really firm sort of pickup window at that point. Um, a lot of people are booking same day as John mentioned, um, but we've had a, quite a few, more than half of folks um, are pre-booking their trips and they're pre-booking uh, subscription trips. So they're you know booking in advance. Um, right now, the average trip time is about 10 minutes. That's the time that people are on board the vehicle. Um, and right now, I know John mentioned this earlier too, um, about half of our riders are calling into the call center to book their trips, but the other half are actively using the app. And of the folks who are using the app, um, we have received a, about a 4.6 out of five star rating. So um, keeping in mind, that's not everybody. Um, it's still pretty good, I think, for, for starting a pilot project that's so different from what we were operating in fixed route. And that's sort of it. That's an overview of, of the first month. Um, certainly we're looking, the last, the first two weeks of February have been um, really successful. The ridership is consistent. So we are, um, you know, hopeful that this pilot will continue to be positive and convenient for folks, so. Thank you very much. I think for me, I think one hand, Representative Shaw, and I thought for me that 20 feet, 20 feet. So we're, we're not in town mm -hmm. uh, for, I don't know if that's good or bad for you folks, but we're not in town. Uh, <laughs> and many of the staff and many state workers are in town. This, I, I would suspect, but I don't know uh, that this may skew your data a little bit uh, where people like myself, if I was staying there, I'd schedule a ride every morning into the state house or something along those lines. Is, will the pilot go on long enough till we get back there uh, and you can get some hard data, data about the town when it's full? Yeah, we hope so. This is a two year pilot project. So, you know, we're six weeks into two years, hopefully COVID starts to calm down a little bit and we start seeing people come back into the office. Um, and John mentioned, we have capacity limits on board our vehicles right now. So they're, um, we're limiting to nine passengers on the small buses. So when we started the service and going back to the question about outreach and marketing, we were really actively marketing to our current riders. We were not pushing out um, big marketing campaigns to attract new riders. The worst thing we could have done was attract a lot more people and then not be able to give them service because of our capacity limits or whatever was happening. And so um, we are working on um, what's the next phase of this rollout as people are being vaccinated, as COVID numbers start to go down, hopefully. Um, what does that launch look like? Do we have a more formal event? Who is the next rider group that we could start marketing to? So the advisory group um, is, is sort of weighing in on that. And then GMT is working really closely with Sustainable Montpelier Coalition to, to plan the next steps. 
So it, it would just seem that the capital shuttle would be pretty popular for this now that you've removed the fixed schedule bus uh, right. transportation there. So right. great, great. Hope we can get a chance to use it. <laughs> Sounds like we will. <laughs> Representative, Mc were you done, Representative Shaw? Okay, <laughs> Representative McCoy. So I, I think we spoke about this last year. Um, you know, when you start getting ridership and you have people that are like I call and I'm expecting the bus within 10 minutes, but between the time I call, you have seven other people that have called. So my 10 minutes is no longer 10 minutes because you're now there on the route before you get to me to pick up. So that, I don't know if we ever received an answer to that or uh, what, you know, at that point, are you thinking you're gonna need more buses or? We'll definitely have to keep track of that. Um, we have had a few instances in the last six weeks where we've only had two vehicles on the road for whatever reason. A, a driver went on break or, you know, somebody booked off and we couldn't cover that shift. And we've seen the utilization numbers go up in that time frame. The way the system works, when you schedule your trip, you're going to get that 30 minute window. So, you know, 12 to 1230. Um, it doesn't matter how many people book you will never be pushed outside of that 30 minute window. So that's some, some level of confidence for folks. And we're actually working with um, Via Transportation. They're the ones who designed the app for us and they're, um, they've provided the driver app. So they're sort of the, you know, the technology partner here. We're working with them to narrow that to 15 minutes. Um, if you think about somebody who doesn't have great access say to a telephone, um, 15 minutes is a lot easier <laughs> to digest in terms of, you know, how long am I going to have to wait for the bus if I don't know exactly when it's coming? Um, so we are working. We're, that's the first um, improvement that we're hoping to make early on. So you'll never be pushed outside that pickup window. Um, you could be, you know, pushed to the far end of it, but it'll never be outside of what you were given at the, at the booking. So then if your your expectation is you're going to be picked up within 30 minutes, but when you get on the bus, there's eight other people on the bus, mm -hmm. will my drop off period be longer? So people, I'm just trying to get a sense mm -hmm. of, you know, if I'm trying to, you know, like uh, Representative Shaw said, I wanna get a, a, instead of taking my vehicle, I can take my car and get to the state house. Right. So how am I going to plan that? So the really great thing about the app is it has a built-in algorithm that it's booking you on a vehicle with people who are going in your same direction. And so, you know, if you're hopping on in Montpelier and you're headed out to CVMC, say, um, you're likely on a bus with folks that are going to the same destination or at least very similar destination to where you're going. Um, and as we can see from the data, people aren't spending more than 10, 10 minutes on the bus on average. So um, to date, it hasn't been an issue. Um, we don't, when somebody's booking, they don't necessarily see what their drop off time is going to be, but the service area itself is only seven and a half square miles. And so it's not likely that you're going to be pushed too far out. And you're not really like, with fix, our fixed route service, you could deviate at any point um, from A to B. It, I think there's a, a more reasonable expectation with this service. And you can also track in real time what's happening. So you can see on your phone if you're sitting there where the bus is and um, where it's going. So, so far, it, it's it's been okay. Um, but we have not, we're not building an expectation for how long it takes folks to get somewhere. Somebody who has a medical appointment, say at one o'clock, like John said, they can book their trip to say, I have to be at this appointment for one and they'll get a pickup window. And that pickup window, you know, could be half an hour, 40 minutes before, but it's designed in a way that will get them there on time. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you, Representative McCoy. I already looked thinking about us being in town. The service stops at 6 p.m. <laughs> So we're never getting back. <laughs> we can get to the state house, but we won't. <laughs> so we'll have to work on that because, you know, there's dinner parties. I'm like, this is really, really good for those snowy nights when you end up way out and you want to come back in. Representative Burke. 
Um, I have a few questions. I've been really excited about this, this whole project. Um, so on a practical level, I have some practical and then some things about funding. Does this bus get me to the VTrans headquarters? What is it called? Barry City Place? Does it go that far? It no. doesn't. So but the service map is basically um, CVMC, or sorry, CCV. Uh -huh. um, and it goes as far as the airport in Berlin. Okay. okay. Um, so uh, is there still a bus that goes there? Yes. Uh, yeah. So okay. the city commuter route. Uh, yeah. has okay. Because I, I knew that some people would take the bus up there. And, um, and then the other question I have and that we're trying to figure out in this budget is that is that there's no money specifically, at least in the proposed budget for the mobility and transportation innovations grants. So I'm just wondering where that's at and why. And then I'm trying to figure out the money for this particular project came from a separate pot. Is that correct? That's I just got confused when we had that earlier conversation. Yes. Uh, we'll let's talk about that. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, yes. And so when first things first is we needed to ground truth and and and, and produce a pilot in that discussion, uh, working with GMT we wanted to ensure that they would have the funds that they needed uh, to transition, buy the software, put the hardware on the vehicles and do the marketing and outreach that we've d discussed. The reason that we don't have additional budget items for microtransit in FY22 is a fewfold. Uh, one is we wanted to ensure that this pilot was working and that we wouldn't want to continue to uh, add pilots if there if this one proved to be an abject failure and of course it, it, it's exactly the opposite um, and also that we do have some latitude moving into FY22 with the CARES Act funds the CRISA funds and those formula funds that uh, we are now instead of using at 50 50 for operations we'll be using the CRISA and CARES Act at 100 percent funds what that does is that sets aside uh, a, a level of formula funds where we could apply that into a microtransit pilot um, if we find uh, a, another opportunity. So we we have some abilities to um, to to move forward with a pilot with our current budget. Um, we are looking to replace uh, a circulator route and not to maybe uh, start a whole new service. We also show in our budget that we have about $2.4 million left over from our CRISA and CARES Act funds uh, at 100% federal to address COVID-related uh, issues or service-related opportunities. And so we do have uh, some, some uh, latitude and flexibility with all of these uh, different types of funds to put toward microtransit. The MTI was very instrumental in allowing us to use some uh, of the state funds for that outreach piece with Sustainable Montpelier Coalition. And that is, uh, that's a 25 page outreach plan where they identify eight cohorts, school kids and, and uh, employment age, people with disabilities on and on, mm -hmm. commuters. Uh, so that uh, we would like to replicate that uh, wherever we go next. We know that uh, uh, our microtransit uh, consultants and uh, potential partners have all stressed the level of that type of robust uh, coordinated local outreach. And Jamie's and, and GMT has just done a really good job of ensuring uh, that uh, the word is getting out. So uh, we, we do stand in a position to... Uh, to pilot another microtransit project in FY22 if the if the opportunity arises. Do you have a you do you have a like any of the providers who've who've expressed a strong interest? Not a strong interest to date. Six weeks in, uh, there was a lot of wait and see, uh, mm -hmm. kind of letting GMT do some of the the hard risky <laughs> work, and uh, now that it's showing uh, to be successful and as uh, as advertised, uh, and as we assessed around the country as our working group, uh, that 
I think we can find some interested uh, regions to proceed uh, with another pilot. You know, it could be with GMT. We, we think about Williston and Charlotte and uh, feeders uh, to and from the Hill institutions that you know may not require to go through the downtown transit center. There's a lot of different scenarios that microtransit could be um, uh, responding to, uh, but uh, we'll have to have those conversations. The key will be to have the level of commitment that GMT has shown to this project, and uh, it won't happen if we, we force it. Um, so this is really a good first step. So just one more question, um, if I may. Um, so, you know, we had a proposal here to put a um, $1.2 million to a mobility and transportation innovation, innovations grant program. But you're saying that you actually have that money already because of all the money you've gotten with the CARES Act it being 100% federal and things like that. Yes, we, we, we have our 40 million plus budget. And, and in that, we would be able to transfer some monies from regular operations, fixed route to microtransit. We have some CRISA funds. Um, we have, uh, and we, so I think uh, we would be able to uh, proceed without having, um, you know, we, we'd be able to proceed if, if we had the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Burke. And I see Representative White's hand is up. So you had two, well, anyway, we'll get into the dollars, but you've, the CRISA funds are what we call the December funds. Okay. The, so, that, so that was, I just wanted just to define that for when people, when we're thinking about it, that's what came in late in December. There was 26 million going to transit. That was going directly to transit. 50.4 was coming through, through, we're going to be coming through the agency and through our hands at that point. But we, the 26 did not need to come through us. It went directly, did not have to pass go or, or deduct $200. <laughs> Went directly out. Can I, I'm going to let Representative White go and then Representative Stebbins. And then I just, I'm going to write my question down on, so I don't forget it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so a very similar questions to what Representative Burke asked. Um, and I'm sure you've had a chance to review the H94 proposal that came out. Um, and there is that 1.2 million going towards um, the mobility to continue the mobility um, grant program. Um, and so I'm, I'm thrilled to hear that there's another source of funding so that we don't need to allocate additional money. But it, I guess that leads me to a bit of anxiety that um, that money isn't marked specifically to continue that program moving forward. Um, because I think what I heard in committee last biennium and what I'm continuing to hear is just the real innovative and powerful nature that these pilots could have on transforming Vermont's um, public transportation system. I mean, when we talk about last mile, first mile, I mean, that those types of problems we're directly responding to here. So I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit to why you wouldn't be supportive of us marking those funds to be used for that grant program and instead why you're comfortable with it, it potentially being available to you through the other funding sources. Sure. Thank you for that. And um, as a program manager, more funds for microtransit programmed and to be drawn down as such is, is, is something that uh, is, is of course attractive to our program. As we talk about our agency budget, and uh, you know, I certainly, as you know, I defer to Michelle and uh, and Lenny and, and the folks who are managing the overall budget. So um, it's always you know that that position that we're in, saying, yeah, that would be great. We think we can do it. The other component of that is that we we had in putting together this budget in August, and then it changed again in December with the December funds. Um, it was also before the microtransit pilot. All I was hoping for FY21 was to have a successful pilot. And, and John and Jamie know that when we talk, it's like, hey, let's make sure this thing's successful because we think with you um, that this does mean something on a large scale in Vermont. But yeah. um, at this point, we uh, could probably do a, a one or two additional pilots in FY22. And with our current budgets, and we have some set-asides and the formula funds that are being 
bit displaced with our uh, December and CARES Act funds. It could be in future years, out years, when we start uh, reaching those limits. Right now, when we receive our formula funds, 5311 formula funds, we generally use it all for operations because we can't use flex funds for operations. That at, so we can use admin, maintenance at 80-20 with our flex funds, all those FHWA funds that we receive but we can only use our formula funds for operations. And FTA provides, oh, $4.6 million for 5311. We were concerned that we would be hitting up against that, uh, that number where we would run out of funds to apply for operations. But right now with um, all the support that we've received through the COVID relief funds, it has allowed us to take a step back and, and, and to buy a few years on the operational front. And in these next two or three years, uh, we will be having much different conversations as we clear through the capital and, uh, um, and, and operational pickups that we're receiving with these COVID dollars. Thank you. I really appreciate that um, explanation. And I understand you're in a, you're in a tight rope <laughs> kind of position where you, you're seeing the great work that these programs are doing. And um, you've also got some, uh, you've got great folks creating the budget. Um, yeah, I have far more questions, but I'll hold for now. <laughs> Representative Stebbins. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Russ. And sorry, I'm going to just keep going in the same vein, um, which is, uh, and it, it may be putting you in um, a place that you can't answer, Ross, to your point, like maybe it needs to go up. Um, but I'm hearing we would and we could and we'd welcome it. I'm not hearing, yes, we're going to do it. And I think that's what I'm looking for. Like, um, what are those next two communities? And how does, how at least do I on this committee um, make that happen for FY22? This was a good step in the right direction, right? When I go back to VPTA and talk about this presentation, the outcomes, initial outcomes and, and data, and that we're being um, asked and, 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 and you're sharing our excitement about the potential, who in this room is going to be applying for that microtransit pilot? I think we can find some, but I don't know who and where at this point. I, in my mind, you think Bennington, you mean other providers? You mean other transit providers? You're going to? I just yes, want to know. Okay. exactly. Yeah, we need the right partner in the right area. But boy, there's a lot of areas and scenarios, as you mentioned, last uh, first and last mile, um, additional services where people don't have uh, uh, transit service, as John had mentioned, and then the replacement of some of our fixed route services that are running around a circle with or without people hoping that we're uh, meeting de people's demands. So those three categories could all be addressed in the next few years uh, with different metrics and different expectations. Can I just add that I think one of our concerns is, you know, we get very excited about it. It's got really good, you know, opportunities here, moving in an advancement. The money that's been brought in allows for the expansion to happen is that for a few years, you'll have that opportunity to put these pilots out there. What we get concerned about is that we wait two years down the line over something that we would do right now or try to get further down the line today when um, that would be our concern is that we find out two years from now, like, oh, nobody wanted it. We didn't do it and the money was needed. Oh. And, and, you know, we, and it's like, we've lost this opportunity. We want to work with you to help you and the others take total advantage of this opportunity that's there. It, and we're not it would taking be, it away from anything else. This is the beauty of this moment of time. It, it would be a dereliction in duty if I did not um, uh, push this mode uh, as best as we can throughout the state for as many uh, 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 people uh, as possible. We, we do feel this is more trips for more people for more purposes than any of our bifurcated or, or uh, you know, special fixed route services. So we, there's a lot of opportunity here. We will proceed. One of the things we want to be aware of, and, and you guys have this conversation all the time, I'm sure, is that we certainly don't want to make investments in services that are not sustainable or that are, um, you know, just to go ahead and, and to build up 
services that don't make a lot of sense. So this pilot is, is very informative and um, these monies that we have set aside uh, will be very useful. Uh, but yes, in, in three, four, five years, we certainly don't wanna be presenting you with a, a budget hole because uh, we've built out to such an extent that uh, we can't sustain services. When your secretary was in the very first days that we were meeting, we talked about trust and that sometimes the relationship is also about, about trusting that, that, that these things will, thus things will occur. But on the practicality, you've got $2.4 million right now that you could, that you are thinking at this moment and the agency's thinking that has the opportunity to continue not only the micro transit, and then I wanna transition into time wise to talk more about some of us need to get our heads wrapped around the difference and the mobility and transit innovation grants, right? Is the 2.4 for both? The, the 2.4 is, is set aside that we feel that we would have to start FY23 with um, because again, uh, we'll be slicing and dicing our formula, our capital funds, our uh, flex funds and our state funds. As we receive these applications in, in April, we've asked our providers to submit their applications a few weeks earlier this year because we have a, a, another layer of considerations as we negotiate those final awards. Uh, but uh, through FY22, I don't see any uh, financial barriers from us proceeding uh, however uh, however we deem appropriate. So maybe you can help me just to make sure that I don't misstep and in an FY23 end up being the source of a reduction of that 2.4 because it's an FY23. That I know where where does it sit? So uh, this is uh, that when we transferred the, fun the funds from state funds uh, and our local funds to 100%, we set aside the, the, the formula funds, we were able to meet uh, our expected projected costs in FY22 with keeping aside $2.4 million in that 100% money. We will also have $6 million or so in our 5311 formula funds, which can be used for any of this at 80, 20 or 50, 50, depending on the activity. Yeah. Uh, so we should um, be able to proceed uh, in, in a measured way where at the end of the day, all the services that we invest in um, meet our thresholds or are uh, proving their value like this microtransit pilot. So in FY23, uh, we would potentially start with paying for a certain amount of our services with those leftover December funds, or because between now and next, yeah, June, we don't know we if something comes up. Let me just let me dial me in because I'm gonna I'm not gonna go look for it on your presentation. The PowerPoint you had at the bottom with that 26 million, some of the uses right, and you had four point something million saved, and you had like three million saved for locals. Is that where the 2.4 is? So on those uh, on those COVID relief funds, and you remembered exactly, uh, four point seven will be saving in I can't state remember funds. Remember your name, but I don't forget a dollar. <laughs> that was like weeks ago. <laughs> um, two, uh, we 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 thought uh, four point seven will save in state yeah. funds. We'll yeah. save about three million dollars in local funds. Yeah. We're going to save about ten million dollars in flex funds, okay. and we'll be able to set aside about four to six million dollars in other formula funds for out years. And so as uh, we, we transfer those funds, that's where that displacement of, of, of those yeah. formulas to the 100% uh, are kind of um, absorbed. All right, and then I've got one other question, then we should talk about the other grant, which you don't have to answer right now is also, so we're getting, I'm getting a sense from you that the, the request or the thinking of a $1.2 million investment is already there, not required, yet we want some assurances that we're going to some somehow assurance that it's going to happen there's right now out there in the rural there's fare free still occurring correct correct the 26 million that came in is there fare free money helping that yes we we expect uh, to uh, maintain fare free service and our 5311 rural area 
and uh, we certainly defer to uh, to John uh, on the 5307 urban uh, program. The urban as we, program is different. I'm talking about the rural program. Rural is going to be fair free in FY22. Already paid for because there's there are requests and people who really want to see this. This is an equity issue, yes. COVID. So we we're gonna. So I'm gonna hold you on that word. Is that fair free is occurring and will occur through FY22? Yes. Excellent. So we can cross that off. And then Representative Corcoran. And then let's talk about the other grants. And I, I guess my, my question, it seems like we're in a, a, a great place for, for public transit, a place we really haven't been in for, you know, uh, a lot of years since, I, since I've been on the committee. And, and, and when I'm looking over my shoulder and there's a $1.9 trillion package that's going to be coming our way probably mid-March. And from what I'm reading, there's a huge amount of money was in the billions of dollars going for public transit. So it sounds like we're going to get another injection of funds. Are we at the point of overkill or do we still see a, a great need to expend those funds? Because you're talking about setting aside funds and, you know, we're not going to get into FY22, but maybe FY23. Are we to the point where we don't know what to do with the money because we have so much of it or just uh, keep curious? We're going to keep sure. it as long as possible. <laughs> uh -huh. It, the, the, the key here is uh, COVID relief and sustainable uh, uh, investments, capital improvements that can save us money on uh, uh, long-term operational costs, uh, fitting up and, and becoming uh, uh, more energy efficient. But no, for us, uh, the key is that we don't we didn't want to go through and 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 force the expenditure of these funds on services that are unsustainable if. COVID didn't happen, um, I was planning to work through our internal budget committee to try to address this operational shortfall that we were uh, projecting, if not in FY21, then uh, in FY22, certainly in out years, because we're able to use our flex funds for new starts, new routes for three years with an 80-20 split. Once that stops at the end of three, the three-year uh, period, pilot period, it comes off our formula funds. So when we were projecting when these services were coming off, we were going to be short um, on our formula. What this does is it relieves some of that pressure and allows us to make capital investments that are long overdue. And it allows us to do some of these pilots and ensure that we can save some federal, uh, some state FHWA and local funds uh, what, uh, as we try to rebuild the economy. Okay, that, and then that's well, under, well understood. But what, I'm, what I, I guess my, my question is, is that I, I think it's a pretty safe bet that we're going to get another fusion of probably, I would say probably at minimum $26 million. If that comes to fruition, is your comfort level up here now and say, all right, we can do this pilot. We don't need to wait to FY23 because our security level is, is so great that we're, we're good. Yeah, with a, with twenty six million dollars coming in at one hundred percent, what I'm hearing and and uh, nothing's been passed, of course, as as you all know, um, is that uh, we have already reached that one hundred and twenty five percent of our total operating budget, which includes admin, PM operations. Uh, so those funds that are identified in this next one point nine million proposal would be really, or trillion. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's just <laughs> crazy. Um, but, it sound, but that sounds like it's going more toward the urban systems and that, uh, and for those systems that, that, that haven't received the funds, funds to the level that we have, but no question when we uh, are, when that is signed and we, we take a look at those awards, we could be having a different conversation and, and pushing out some of these pilots in a more uh, robust way. Yeah, and that's my concern because we're going to, you know, see that I think, well, we're maybe we'll always still have the bill, you know, anticipation that this bill is going to be passed, you know, first couple of weeks of March. And uh, I, I wouldn't put past anything past our, our delegation as far as trying to swing money more our way. So I just, you know, wanted to get a picture saying, all right, this does come our way. The comfort level for the administration is there as far as starting a uh, pilot down, you know, wherever. 
And it's going to be about encouraging our providers and working with you and getting the group and making sure that they've got the energy and the support that they need to. So we'll, I don't want to, I want to, I don't want to over push them either too, because we've just, we have it today, but right. if, yeah, but um, I'm sure you're working with them and they're listening. This should be oh, yeah. right now. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Can you talk to, can you, if, unless there's another question, can, can, can you help this newcomer back to the committee on the, the mobility and transit innovation grant? How much did we put in? Where is that at now? Mm -hmm. I'll turn it over to uh, Dan Courier, the uh, government program manager. Dan, thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, so happy to answer some questions. Uh, I see we've got about eight minutes and I won't keep you past your three o'clock deadline. That's right, so, uh, coming in next. Yeah, no worries. And <laughs> so I just want to start off by, you know, so so 100% of the $500,000 was awarded. Uh, we handed out 13 grants in total. How much There's was 12, the money? I'm sorry, what was it? 500,000. 500,000? Yep. And uh, we awarded uh, 13 grants and there was a total of 12 grantees. And so, because Local Motion actually received two grants. Um, and if you look at the, the link that was shared, uh, thank you, Representative White. Um, you'll see that it summarizes in the local motion that they got um, 500,000 for two projects. Just when you go and have that little look. In the end, I just wanna give you a quick summary. Um, in total, we awarded um, microtransit, actually two of the uh, two microtransit pilots uh, got funding. Ludlow requested money for a microtransit study. So they're not operating, but they're gonna study something. So that might be an opportunity uh, for us to step into in fiscal year 2022. And then also um, for the projects were related to bike, uh, either electric bikes or bike share. Uh, three of the projects uh, were related to public transit, even providing rider support. Uh, one project was uh, related to telework. And three of the projects were focused on car share or mobility support uh, through either uh, providing new incentives for leaving your single occupancy vehicle at home, starting a van pool or other modes. And so that's the total of 13 right there. The, um, I've been in touch myself as the, as the grant lead uh, for this program. Every grant uh, has been uh, started. Um, everyone is able to start their work through a notice to proceed. And of the uh, 13 projects, I know that nine are underway. And so, and I haven't had in much contact with, um, with the other four that are missing from that list. And so it's looking very good. I kind of expect um, a slow start, just given how we, the awards worked out over the holiday. But through the month of February, once that wraps up into the month of March, I'm happy to come back and report out on some metrics of what we've seen so far. I know that in particular, uh, we have a number of projects related to equity and it'd be really interesting to share some of the results of their work um, in Burlington. And you're right. I'm sorry, I wanted to turn because I started printing some of your your work, um, trying to capture as fast as I can some of your necessary. I, when I go to the floor, people will ask me, what did we do? And I'll say, just talk to Dan. <laughs> Happy to talk to anyone. Uh, so $500,000, 13 awards to 12 grantees. It's all out the door. It's all out there happening. Yep. And you have access for this project for other awards through that 2.4 million there's i'm trying to get at is there a requirement right now or is there a need now to to put more money in this uh right now uh the, what we funded uh it met the need of, for the project that were presented and so um as for whether we'd like to continue the program i'll kind of turn that back to ross Sure. I mean, okay. really quick, we think that these projects will extend into FY22, many of them with 12 to 18 month timeframes and implementation periods. So uh, we need to work through these uh, projects first and uh, see what to build on, what, what didn't work, those types of things. 
Uh, but uh, yeah, so I think through FY22, just wrapping up these 13 projects may be uh, about the best uh, we can do. Uh, this quite quite taxing to administer all this for, for, for Dan, but uh, he's uh, been doing a great job. Thank you, Dan. We just want to make sure that we don't have a gap or that there isn't, you're, you know, as you're processing this one, that you're not all, that there isn't efforts to start bringing in new, new ones that would be happening next. Well, the other uh, piece of the program or considerations are that Dan is the Govermont program manager. That is a transportation demand management program of $750,000 for carpools and van pools and our trip planner and um, uh, kind of a clearinghouse for all efficient transportation. He has some latitude for awareness, outreach, um, and to fund projects like the ones that we were able to uh, uh, proceed with uh, the MTI funds with. So we shouldn't have a gap. Uh, I'm hoping that we can reveal enough success and, um, and benefit that this becomes an ongoing program. But in FY22, we're just kind of getting started, you know, right now. So even if you had more dollars, you might not have the capacity, you're saying, to actually roll out anymore? Uh, we would find the capacity. We have retainers. We have, we have, you know, Dan keeps working, uh, you know, no, uh, but uh, yeah, so. Make hay while the sun shines. <laughs> Yeah, it's it, it is a lift, but um, we're 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 not bound by uh, admin limitations at this point. So I'll end with one last question. Then it's Representative Burke's turn. Are there grantees out there that have been left unfulfilled, Dan? Were there you know you, the thirteen? Are there projects that didn't get awarded that could have been? There was only one project that I can think of. We received, you know, the, of the request, there was only one project that kind of fell just below the threshold. Um, of the other, you know, we actually received a total of 18 projects. Some of them were just not a good fit for this program. They were requesting items that didn't meet the nature of the grant. And so there might've only been one left. Um, and to be fair, it's been such a long time and, there's been so many, you know, you know, swirling projects in my head. I'm not, I cannot recall it at this time. So uh, the need really didn't uh, outweigh uh, what was funded. So, okay, Representative Burke. Sorry, I took so long. Sort of on the same theme. So, if an organization, you know, has a great idea or whatever, are they are they going to be deterred, like because there aren't you're not taking any new programs? in 2022, uh, how, do we, how do we avoid that sort of, oh, there's this great program, oh no, it stopped kind of uh, idea? Sure, um, I can speak to that only because uh, that's what I used to do uh, for VTrans and for the public transit shop as the Govermont program manager, which was to actively engage with those who have the TDM ideas, programs, projects, um, assistance, uh, so when we started 15 years ago, we just wanted a carpool matching service and then it became van pools. And now we have 12 or 13 contracts that are ongoing. So anybody with a good TDM idea would be working through Dan and the Govermont program uh, initially anyway. And we would use those those funds to, uh, uh, you know, to, to support their good work. Thank you. Somebody's not going to get turned away at the door. Somebody comes to the door saying like, oh my God, I've got this innovative strategy for projects. You're not going to say, oh, come back in 2013 or 2023. No, we've never done that. We've been able to uh, generally uh, leverage uh, those activities through Covermont. And I must say, when I think about uh, uh, Michelle, myself and Dan scored those proposals, uh, I think the ones that we decided not to fund were the ones that uh, we thought that were being covered through other okay. projects or through Govermont already, those types of things. So uh, we don't have any great TDM ideas that came to us that we were unable to proceed with. Um, I don't see that happening in FY22 either. I, I would go on that word trust again. We, we don't wanna, we don't wanna put out a lot of money that isn't needed. But on the other hand, we don't, if there are innovations and ideas, especially in this time, we don't want it stifled for that reason. 
we're going to trust you. Correct. <laughs> and not stifle them and, and say, hey, legislators, we at budget adjustment, we might need something. But I'm going with Representative Corcoran. We're going to we're going to have some room. Yes. And um, no question that uh, the level of support we received from the administration and, and state funds with the, with the flex funds, uh, we've all we started in a really good position in terms of rural transit investment per person, far outpacing most rural areas. These additional funds, these micro transit ideas, the IT that we've already invested in for a better ride, that's all happening. And uh, even if we had to start with a really great big project that we haven't considered yet, to some extent or to some level, while we talk to you about these uh, projects and these opportunities uh, at this time next year, uh, we wanted we wouldn't have to uh, 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 say no. We could say yes to some degree while we share with you the, the opportunities and the needed funding. Uh, but um, no question, uh, we we we've been well supported to to proceed in almost every avenue that that we've wanted to. Well, it's three o'clock, and this was enlightening and informative, and I'm glad we had you in. And we're going to try real hard to not make you eat food money if you, if you don't need it. But we're going to, but we reserve the right to do so. <laughs> All right, Thank committee. You. This was good. What I learned here is that some very happy news around the dollars that they have available for them. And that some of the thinking that was in a bill that many people within our, our body have supported, we can now we can now lean on the fact that we're getting information that fair free will be funded through 22 and we did nothing. We're going to, we're going to take all the glory and have done nothing for it, <laughs> but at this point. So um, that is very, that's very happy, happy news. All right. I'm going to put that over here and now we're going to switch a gear. We're going to bid adieu. I'm sorry. I never, I'm not used to excusing witnesses. I'm just, Thank you very much, Ross, Dan, John, Jamie. Thank you. We look forward to coming back to Montpelier and riding your bus all day long. Thank you so much. Thank and, you. And so we're going to switch now. Ridership is really going to go up. Yes, especially to the state house. You, you could have to put an after hours one for dinner time. For yeah, I just uploaded the app, so I'm all set. Thanks. I'm ready. Just to go. Good. <laughs> You're ready to go. Ready I'm to ready take to our presents. <laughs> It'll be all like Representative Shaw, get us a ride home. All right, we're gonna switch a gear. We're gonna move to DMV, or actually not. Well.